Hey guys, my name is Brady Bissett. I'm a cinematographer and DP, and today I'm gonna to show you how to get excellent product lighting regardless of your experience level or budget, and this applies to photo as well, not just video. So first step, we're gonna turn this room into our mock studio for the day. So the main goal for this shoot is control lighting. So with that, we're gonna take any natural light that we find and may interfere with our shot, and we're gonna black that out. So I started with the windows around my scene. I use trash bags for the windows, black trash bags, they work great. And since I was shooting in the day, some of the light was spilling in from the hallway as well, so I just use a bed sheet and gaff tape that up to the wall. And then once I set up my camera, I noticed that I was still getting some reflection on the product in the background of light that was just seeping through the cracks. So I created a flag with a trash bag and set that up on a stand and then taped the other half to the wall. And that just blocked out whatever was behind me. You could use a five in one disc reflector as well, but just make sure that the black side is facing your set because it's gonna be acting as negative fill or a flag rather than bouncing light back like you would on the silver side or the white side. And especially when it comes to working with anything reflective, it's very important to keep an extra eye out for anything that you see in the background that's casting any weird reflections or even your clothes because that can always get caught up in the reflections as well and you can see yourself. Always try to wear black if possible. And obviously the less external light that you have in your room, the easier it is. But I've got a lot of windows here and I wanted to give myself a challenge rather than just shooting in a basement or something like that. Or you can just shoot at night. It would make things a lot easier. So now let's create the scene. I personally went with the black backdrop on this one. I just felt that it added to the mood and added to the look I was going for. But any color that you feel suitable, would work great. White is very common, um, and any other color that might match or complement the product would work great. So since my set was relatively small, my DIY backdrop that I chose was just a bendable poster board that you get from the dollar store. And obviously, if your set is larger, you can't use one of those because if you just get a million of the poster boards, you're gonna see all the individual lines. So something like bed sheets, curtains, tablecloths, or even if you wanna buy a uh, rollout paper backdrop. So I took the poster board and I put it on a table and I rested it up against a light stand, but you could obviously put it up against the wall and tape it there. The main goal is just to avoid having any creases or wrinkles or anything like that because you want it to have a smooth roll off in the background, kind of giving it that infinity pool look, going off into nothing. So another super easy tip to get really, really cool reflections, I took a pane of glass out of a picture frame that I had and I cleaned it with glass cleaner because whenever light is shining on anything, especially glass, it picks up every piece of dust and every smudge there is on it. So I made sure it was perfectly clean, just like Chip Skylark and his shiny teeth. Shiny teeth and, me. and then I put that on top of the black poster board. So then that fills the frame more, giving you the reflection of your product in the frame too and eliminating a lot of that negative space. And then, like I said before, it always gets dusty, so I continued to dust the scene with one of those little dusty, squeezy air things, air tools, and make sure that everything was spotless throughout the duration of the shoot. So for camera setup, it's very important to have a shallow depth of field to avoid seeing the edges of the glass and the backdrop and anything else in the background. So to achieve this, we're gonna have to have a very wide open aperture something like 1.4, 2, 2.8. You may not have a lens that fast or that wide open, so however close to that you can get is great. And then also it helps to have a lens with a very short focus distance, like a macro lens, something that you can get really close to it to make sure you get a lot of the really nice close details of whatever product you're shooting. And this only applies for kind of smaller things like jewelry or this bottle or something like that. But again, having a macro lens or something where you can get really tight is something you really want. And even though it's typically preference, I believe that shooting in something slow-mo, like 60 frames a second or 120 frames a second if your camera has it, makes everything just look very smooth and buttery and elegant. So that's the look I was going for. I was bouncing between 60 frames a second and 120 frames a second through the duration of this shoot. If you're unsure of how frame rates affect slow motion and how it helps it, leave a comment below and I'll make sure to do a video of that next. But since we're pretty limited as to where we can move the camera to avoid getting the edges of the backdrop in it, it's probably best to keep the camera on a tripod, but movement is how we keep the viewer engaged. So the question is, how the heck do we get movement? Well, you can move a different element other than just the camera, like the lights or even the product itself. Well, let's start with the lights. At any given time, I was only using one light during this shoot. And with almost every shot, I made a dynamic movement with my light. So instead of moving my camera, I'm moving the light to maybe reveal the product or just add motion to the frame. So as my first shot, I used my Aperture 120D and I put that on a C-stand. And then with that, I added some diffusion. I added the Aperture Dome because especially with reflective surfaces, it's very important to have a large light source 
because then it's a very soft, pleasing reflection. Rather than having a very harsh single source light, you can see exactly where it's coming from and it's a little bit just unpleasing, ugly. But with diffusion, any large source of diffusion, it spreads evenly and nicely and cleanly across the product and it kind of goes unseen by the viewer and nobody looks at it and says, there's a harsh light there. It's just a nice, creamy, smooth, uh, reflection of whatever light source you're using. But next, after that, I added a grid to my dome. And the purpose of that is to just direct it and keep it going straight down because I didn't want it to spill onto the background or anything like that. I just wanted to keep it isolated to just the product. And then to add the movement, since I had it on the arm of the C-stand, I swung it out and then I brought it back into the frame slowly. And that was acting as, I guess, a reveal showing the product coming in from the shadows and giving it the movement of the light kind of bending and turning around the product as the light came into the frame. So it gives a really cool look and it's a really good way to reveal a subject from the shadows and add movement to it. And the light that you use doesn't need to be something pricey like an aperture like this. There are many cheap alternatives, especially on Amazon. The first set of lights I got were like $60 and it's just a light in a little white softbox dome and that still diffuses it and makes it soft and nice. So again, you don't need an aperture or anything like that. There's plenty of cheap alternatives. So here's another technique, silhouettes. And for this, I use my Aperture LS Mini, but of course other alternatives like a flashlight, especially one of those LED flashlights work just as well. But to get this look, rather than shining the light directly on the product, we're gonna try shining it directly onto the backdrop instead. And doing this while leaving the product in focus outlines it really nice and kind of leaves it in the shadow. And this works great for accentuating sharp edges and the profile of the product, making it look really, really sleek. And since the bottle we were using is glass, some of the light bounced back from the backdrop and then back onto the product, backlighting it and illuminating the corners that much more, giving it a really, really cool look. And it's fun to play with glass and light just to see how the light refracts and kind of bends and makes all these cool shadows and lines. And that brings another topic of bouncing light in any which way for that matter. I bounced it right off of the black card in front of me and that did a really cool job of just showing some of the profile of the, of the bottle without giving away exactly what was there. It's kind of a mysterious look, but bouncing light in weird ways, especially just taking it and moving it around the set and looking at the camera and seeing what happens is definitely a great idea. I guarantee it, every time you do that, something's gonna catch your eye and you're gonna be like, ooh, that looks really cool, let me try it. And then you try it over again and you didn't even plan on getting that shot, but there you go, it might even be, end up being one of your favorites. So there's some lighting techniques that you can consider, but there's definitely more that we can do to take this to the next level. So rather than moving the lighting, we're gonna move on to moving the product itself in a very, very common and DIY way to get some product movement without it being shaky or your hand being in it is getting something like a Lazy Susan or something that spins and putting it under the product just to spin it and get it rotating or moving in any which way. Another method that some people use is putting fishing line around the product and tying it in a weird way so that when you turn it, the product turns as well. But again, just getting any kind of movement and then combining that with a dynamic light, that's when things really start to look cool like I did here. And because I'm very extra and I always wanna go one step further, I really, really wanted to put my camera in 120 frames a second, get it really slow and splash some water on it. So again, like I said before, not all cameras have 120 frames a second. iPhones have 240, so that's like twice as slow as what my camera did. But 60 frames a second is still slow enough and you still get a really, really cool effect. And once I got my shot locked into exactly how I wanted it, I wanted to add a little bit more movement by rack focusing as the water came in. And rack focusing essentially is adjusting the focus as the shot is playing out. So in this case, I wanted to rack focus from the water in the foreground and as the water splashed in on the product, I wanted to focus in and lock it in on the, on the bottle and on that polo label. So you can do this on the lens just by setting it to manual focus and kind of taking note of where, of where the focus points are, kind of like pre-plan and mark each like A and B point. But for me, I used my wireless Nucleus Nano autofocus system because one, I didn't want it to shake the lens when I turned it. It's a lot easier just to do it wirelessly. And two, that lens has the option to set A and B points. So I just pulled the focus back to where I wanted it to start and then made a point and then turned it to where I wanted it to finish and made another point. So I could just turn the wheel all the way and it would be super easy and not save me the headache trying to mentally remember where my fingers were on the focus wheel. But I've still done it plenty of times in the past, just the old fashioned way, if you will, turning it 
back and forth and mastering it that way. But nonetheless, rack focusing is another way to kind of spice up your shot and add in some movement in there. If you can't move the lights or can't move the product, best you can do is at least rack focus and have control over where the viewer's eye is going. If something is blurry, they're not necessarily gonna look at it until it comes into frame, so they're gonna keep their eye going around in the frame, and that's still, a, a, I guess, a sense of movement. But those are all the tips that I've got for you today, so let's go ahead and take a look at all of the shots that we got combined. They'll have no choice but to ask the question. That age-old question. Who smells so good? And your response? Yes, it's me. You're that guy now. I really hope you like this tutorial, guys. Again, I always love to see the work that you are doing, so please DM me, tag me in it, email it, send me a letter with the link, whatever you wanna do, and I'd love to take a look at it and see what you guys are doing with what I'm teaching you. But until next time, Thank you so much. I'll see you soon and consider this class dismissed.